designing for uh, leg systems. Uh, I'm going to talk today uh, mostly about animal, as you uh, might have guessed already. Uh, I'm going to give a sort of brief introduction about uh, quadrupedal robots, uh, how quadrupedal robots, robots have evolved, uh, so, uh, so kind of how we got here. And I'm going to present a kind of overview of uh, motion planning methods that uh, are, are already available for you and you know, how you should go about choosing uh, a method for your particular sort of project. Uh, in essence, this is going to be just an introduction for Mathieu's presentation. So the truth is that this is going to be maybe the boring part and then Mathieu is going to present the, the, the cool part, sort of the methods that you should be using when you're uh, motion planning and controlling uh, for the robots that you're using currently. Uh, so um, I'm going to kind of, uh, many of the points that I'm going to touch, uh, you've uh, already heard one way or the other during the winter school. Uh, so I'm going to try to be uh, quite brief and uh, hand over to Mathieu. Uh, these are the uh, robots that we're using in MIMO. Uh, Talos, the Wondercraft, Exoskeleton, an animal. Uh, I'm gonna uh, focus on the animal. Uh, this is kind of the history of leg robots. These are starting from really early days. Uh, I've, I've sort of started with uh, the Phony Pony, which was in Stanford in uh, 1968. So th there were other uh, sort of machines before that that were either steam powered or pedal powered, but I, I didn't want to go that, that far back. Uh, so this is this is kind of I, I'm not sure if this is the one that started everything, because you know I, I've missed a lot of robots in this timeline, of course, right? There, there's a lot of like systems that are missing here, but this is kind of the the, the sort of earliest one that I can. I, I would sort of classify as a sort of uh, electrically driven uh, quadruped. So this is, th these bits here are, are, are power drills. So they sort of slapped power drills on, onto like a skeleton and they created this kind of quadruped. Uh, the next one is this really interesting walking track from uh, uh, General Motors. And the, the interesting bit here is that it's, it's hydraulically actuated. It's, it's, and the, the person inside uh, really sort of pulls and pushes levers and selects which legs are actuated. And uh, he's in, a, in, in an exoskeleton, in essence, in the truck. And he uses his legs to sort of fill the ground and uh, move the legs of the truck uh, one at a time or two at a time. So he, he gets. He gets haptic feedback from the hydraulic system, and he's got kind of the force that he's exerting with his legs is being sort of uh, uh, augmented and sort of passed through the uh, the, the, the kinematic structure of, of the walking truck. Uh, and of course, this was a cool idea, I guess, uh, at the time. But uh, in practice, this was like super hard to work with, and you know the people that were trained and were working with that. Had to be super fit because they would, you know, work it for half an hour and then they would be completely kind of uh, uh, tired. Uh, then sort of smaller uh, quadrupeds from uh, Hirose Lab. So th these are these are all uh, these both, if I remember correctly, are from the Titan series, and the Titan series is is actually still going. Like uh, there are Titan robots. Uh, you know, of course they, they don't look like that anymore. They're much more kind of. Uh, sort of current, uh, <coughs> but the Hiroshi lab is sort of still strong at building these sort of smaller quadrupedal robots. And of course this brings us to the 80s with the sort of uh, really uh, groundbreaking or revolutionary work of uh, Mark Reibert and the MIT Leg Lab, uh, which kind of set the sort of uh, foundations for the robots that we are seeing today. So these are the early days and these are kind of recent years. Uh, a, a similar slide was also uh, yesterday in Marco's talk. So if you, if you, if you pay, pay close attention, there was this kind of gap in the 90s. 
Uh, <coughs> I'm not exactly sure why this is. Maybe people here might have, uh, you know, the, the, their own sort of opinions about it. I, I, I think. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, my my pet theory is that a lot of people in the 90s uh, were looking into passive dynamics and uh, uh, sort of uh, limit cycles that you know you can get from uh, passive walkers and so on. And, and these were, you know, the passive walking kind of. Uh, parting was was super tricky to do with uh, with quadrupeds, so nothing was done there. Or no, I, I heard once. I'm not very keen on on these uh, on these things, but uh, I heard one that was uh, Honda with Asimo, which developed this uh, the, what, the motors the harmonic and the gears. harmonics. That was a breakthrough. And yeah. I don't know at which point in history we should put yeah. this. Maybe, but uh, and like the older guys were tired because it did not properly work, yeah. and after that, maybe. I don't know. But uh, as far as we don't know, these guys use harmonic gears, right? Maybe not. So maybe. I, I guess that you know, uh, turn of the millennia people sort of were, were tired of passive walkers and like, all right, let's 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 get into quadrupeds. Uh, the main thing, as also uh, Marco highlighted yesterday here, is that this uh, sort of early. Recent year, but kind of early quadrupeds were uh, position controlled, were quite stiff, uh, and uh, yeah, they were quite small, and everything has to be kind of uh, tightly controlled. Uh, sort of more recently, uh, we've seen like others sort of went bigger. Uh, ETHs kind of uh, tried to stay small with the electric, uh, electrically actuated quadruped. Uh, and then sort of this brings us to nowadays, of course, these are not all the quadruplets that we've seen, you know, from 2000 until now. There's, there's many quadruplets missing here, and I'm really sorry if I've, uh, I've missed your sort of uh, particular uh, quadruplet that, uh, that you like most. Uh, so, but the, the, main, the main key point to take away is that uh, we've seen like a, a really sort of strong paradigm shift going from rigid actuation to uh, compliant con uh, actuation. So uh, be that active or passive compliance, you know, everybody sort of realized that if you want to interact closely with the environment, you need to have <coughs> some, some level of force control so that you can regulate force that you apply to the environment. Uh, all right, which kind of brings us to today. Uh, well, I, I, I guess, you know, uh, uh, 2018 has been super successful for quadrupeds, and you know, 19 I think is going to be uh, the same or more. Uh, these are examples of uh, Boston Dynamics and uh, Anibotics. So on the left column is uh, uh, Boston Dynamics Spot Mini deployed in uh, construction site in, in Japan for doing monitoring of, of construction sites. And uh, on the on the right, a uh, couple of videos that uh, also we've seen yesterday. Uh, so, uh, inspection in a uh, offshore, I think it's, it's a gas platform or oil platform with the animal, and this is like the latest and greatest demo that uh, Anibotics gave at the uh, CES, the Consumer Electronics uh, Expo, in uh, in Las Vegas, uh, I think the beginning of January. So, your know, animal steps out of a delivery van, this kind of uh, last mile delivery, and steps over this uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, what's it called? Thing? It's a scooter. <laughs> scooter, I guess, mobility scooter or whatever. And then goes up the stairs and kind of delivers the packets to, to the door. To the door. <coughs> uh, and these are, you know, these are not, these are proper sort of commercialization directions. These are not sort of just lab uh, examples. Uh, these are real spaces. And uh, this is surprising, you know. Uh, this is really nice to sort of eventually get to. So this kind of only helps to support that quadrupeds are really a platform that has matured enough to already sort of uh, see its commercial application. Uh, so I'm very sorry for the crowd here that is working on humanoids, but uh, I think we can, we can see that. Uh, you know, humanoids still have some way to go, as, as we also discussed uh, uh, last night over dinner. And uh, th this is not that the, the humanoid sort of morphology sort of 
worse or lacking or whatnot, but uh, it's, it's a bit more tricky to get right. The, the quadruplets are a bit more simple, both in terms of uh, uh, their mechanics and in terms of their controls. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my next couple of slides as well. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I was talking about. So the, the, the main advantage is that you have a, a lower center of mass, uh, so it's easier to kind of uh, not fall over. Uh, you get a bigger area of support that you can, you know, also easily uh, regulate. So when you need, you have a small uh, footprint, but you can regulate your area of support, right? Uh, and you have simple uh, kinematic set and I mean, so uh, as we uh, also saw yesterday, uh, you know, most of the quadrupeds have three uh, degrees of freedom per leg. Uh, some might have four. Uh, but this is this is a lot simpler than the legs that humanoids need to have to be sort of performant, right? And uh, this also translates to the uh, actuation technology that uh, you need to be able to have uh, set quadruplets. And also the dynamic models are a lot simpler. So you have uh, one big box, you can uh, model the mass uh, there, you can assume that your legs are massless, and you know this simplifies a lot your... Uh, both your motion planning and your control uh, uh, sort of formulation. Uh, okay, one other thing, you know, you, you can, uh, quadruplets are flexible in the sense that you can use uh, a number of different gates for, uh, for different environments or for different tasks. Uh, the truth is that in most cases, you know, we've seen uh, a lot of trotting, which is kind of the easiest to implement and sort of very, uh, advantageous in terms of you know like uh, 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 and supporting loads and uh, you know having reactive behaviors and then you know walking and so on the the other I mean you know galloping running okay you know it's, uh, the advantage is that you can go fast but it's it's a bit hard to control and so on so in, in most cases the the useful gates for for us sort of uh, looking into quadrupeds in you know uh, real-world deployment and so on would be walking and floating and this is, this is what you see if you, if you survey the literature, this is what you focus uh, mostly up to now. Uh, and then of course, I mean, this is a, this is a, uh, you know, this is an argument for both legged uh, uh, platforms for, uh, for humanoids and for quadrupeds, you know, the, these platforms are really good for, for environments that are built for humans. So if you have environments with things that you need to step over, or have steps and stairs, you need something with legs, wheel platforms are great for flat areas and so on, but then if you, if you have uh, facilities that are big like that, and you need to go up and down stairs, you, you know, you, you'd rather need to have a specially built uh, track or wheel vehicle, which is most of the time bulky and so on, or a user quadruped, which uh, is the, the way to go, of course, as I would support. Uh, now, uh, of course, there 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 are uh, uh, a number of things that make makes our life sort of harder. So there are complexities with the system. So this is a complex machine. It's uh, uh, redundant and it's underactuated. You know, if you want to move from one place to the other, you cannot just uh, regulate an error of the base. You need to apply force to the environment through your legs uh, in order to accelerate your 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 base and reach sort of your targets. Uh, this happens in uh, the environments by making and breaking contact, sort of making and breaking contact as we've seen also with, uh, uh, for example, for state estimation. Uh, has its own set of uh, uh, disadvantages uh, for both the uh, estimation part and for uh, the mechanism itself. So you need to have a different set of uh, actuators, you need to have a different set of uh, sensing modalities that you, need, you, you know, uh, are integral kind of to your control approach. And then you have a set of constraints that you need to uh, take care of your motion planning and your control formulation need to, uh, you know, uh, be aware of. So you have unilaterality constraints as with all the uh, leg systems. You cannot apply uh, torques at point feet. You cannot uh, have pulling forces. And then you have constraints in, 
in the form of uh, joint limits or torque limits and uh, so on that you know you need to take into account when you're designing your formulation. Uh, and this is, this is only the complexity that there is uh, you know, from the system. Uh, we of course need to factor in that this robot is you know, operating in an environment that we cannot uh, control really and this kind of blows up in uh, complexity and you know that, that, that's why a lot of the time uh, examples that work uh, only kind of reach a, a locally uh, good solution and you know we often have trouble formulating uh, solutions that can give us uh, global optimality guarantees and so on uh, in contrast to sort of more well-structured or uh, well-discretized uh, planning domains. Uh, so, but uh, there is still hope. We've been at it for quite some years and we've developed uh, approaches that are uh, reasonably good at uh, motion planning and control, of course. Uh, so I'm going to try to give like an overview of the uh, main directions that we've uh, gone down through for motion planning. Uh, this, is, this is not a complete list. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything here. I'm going to give a kind of an overview of uh, what the main sort of uh, approaches are. Uh, if you have suggestions for anything that I might have left out, please uh, do tell me or send me an email. And I will include this in my in my next presentation. So to start with, a lot of the early days uh, approaches started with search and sampling. So uh, search-based or planning-based motion uh, planning you know, was kind of uh, the obvious <coughs> choice coming from a computer science background. And uh, what I've how 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 I sort of uh, started to describe this is as the engineering approach. So this, this <coughs> was, uh, you know, what, uh, for example, Little Dog or our early work with uh, uh, Haikyuu did. This is a kind of a divide the conquer approach. We sort of uh, try to separate the, the problem into uh, a number of uh, different uh, bits or a number of different sub-problems that we can, you know, easily manage. We come up with a solution for the next problem, for the, for the first problem and then go to the second one. So in that in that sense, you know, you have to sort of design everything by hand. In, in essence, you have to, you know, figure out. I'm gonna be doing this gate, and uh, I'm I'm gonna have this contact sequence. So you have like a a, a sub block that sort of, you know, you give it out uh, a environment model. It spits out a contact sequence, and then this contact sequence is passed to another sort of uh, module that says, all right, to sort of achieve this. Uh, uh, contact being in that state, you need uh, uh, that many seconds, and you know to uh, sort of move your uh, your body from this state to the other state, you need uh, that many seconds. Uh, so another sort of block uh, uh, gives you the timing between uh, that, and then you have a, a, a separate sort of uh, CUM trajectory building block, mostly. ZMP, for example, that might contain <coughs> optimization step and so on. Uh, all that sort of, you know, builds up a reference trajectory that is passed to a module that is executing everything on the robot. Uh, this works quite well in practice. I mean, we've 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 you know worked a lot on these approaches, and we can make them work. Uh, in practice, they're quite fast and sort of easy to get into, uh, but the, the, the biggest disadvantage with uh, this is that uh, right, I mean the, the obvious disadvantage is that you need to design everything by hand, so there's a lot of uh, hand tuning and uh, heuristic sort of designing, which in some cases, it, you know, it, it's more like a kind of a, a art than science. And the, the thing is that you know all your uh, design uh, choices uh, from the let's say starting building blocks affect the performance of the robot. Sort of uh, what this means that you limit the kind of range of uh, behaviors that you can discover to a very sort of limited set that you know your hand-tuned system sort of caters for. 
Uh, yeah, but you know these things work, and uh, they might be a good solution to uh, some of our problems. Now going to optimization, which is kind of the main thing that uh, uh, Mathieu is going to focus on uh, after me. Uh, the sort of main two uh, ways of framing that without uh, uh, sort of pointing at particular implementations or uh, or yeah, solvers and whatnot is you need to design by hand a cost that uh, sort of tells your optimizer which way to move in the solution space. Uh, most of the approaches that uh, I'm aware of, you either need to have a contact sequence or uh, if you wish gate specified, <coughs> time, a way of generating time, and then your optimizer would give you a, a central mass trajectory and your leg trajectories, for example. Or this can be the other way around. Uh, there are a few approaches that uh, you design the cost and you give a, a target to your sort of deep optimization formulation and you get everything out. Uh, Carlos has an example, for example, uh, with IQ. Uh, but these tend to be quite uh, computationally expensive. So the big sort of disadvantage of these methods that you know you sort of don't need to do much, but uh, you need to kind of be uh, design a good cost for the behavior that you want to achieve. Uh, they tend to be, you know, they, they, they look into a really big uh, solution space and uh, finding a good uh, solution in that space is it, hard. Uh, so, in comparison to the search based and sampling based approaches, th these are much more flexible. You know, you can have uh, different uh, gates, you can have different behaviors. Uh, you know, they're much more sort of free form, but still, they have uh, many uh, design decisions. Uh, you need to be able to uh, tune costs appropriately to get the behavior that you want. And uh, I think that uh, we're now kind of in, in, a, in a state where we have a kind of a design methodology to be able to use this, uh, uh, this optimization approach. So I, my personal opinion is that the optimization methods are now uh, mature enough to be used in sort of more uh, out of the lab deployments. Uh, so, and this, this is going to be the focus of uh, Matthias talk. What we've uh, <laughs> recently sort of started to, to see is the machine learning approach. For example, the paper from Gemin that uh, Mark also presented uh, uh, last night. So here, uh, this is in many cases model free or, uh, you know, you would want to learn approximation of your model. Uh, it's, uh, I, you know, policy controllers can be task specific, but in general the approaches are very general. Once you, once you have a good approach, you can use it for, for different uh, tasks. And uh, it suffers, of, of course, from the cost tuning kind of um, curse that uh, all of these cost-based uh, approaches you know, uh, have. There's no sort of uh, easy way around that. Uh, the big problem this far is that you need a lot of data, and sometimes generating data is not that easy, or you know, if you have a, a, a good controller that already works, quite well and you know generates data why do you need to learn the sort of behavior of the controller uh, of course there are yeah there are arguments uh, uh, to that in the sense that you, you can learn a controller that uh, sort of is an approximation of a good controller that you really have but generalizes better to some areas that your controller is not that sort of great at <coughs> and of course we've we've I, I think that everybody here has kind of suffered with trying to uh, uh, things that look really great in simulation to reality and on hardware, you know, things break and your controller suffers from, you know, delays and uh, noise and model dynamics and so on. Uh, but yeah, I think that in this sort of learning side of uh, motion planners, we're scratching the surface and there's a lot of uh, work to be done. 
and uh, a lot of things to be developed to have uh, something sort of as stable as our search-based or sampling controllers, motion planners, or uh, as mature as the optimization ones. Uh, of course, somebody here might point out that the learning base of the optimization ones are quite sort of similar if you sort of look as learning as optimization. But uh, yeah, this is my kind of. Uh, I have a question. What is your opinion on the use uh, if you combine policy with task controller, do you think a sealed reality gap is a problem? I, I'm not sure I understand your question. So imagine that your policy is not just, it not, the output of the policy is not important. Mm -hmm. but you are, you are, pass, you are passing through a controller filter, let's say. Yeah. That you put there like task controller. So you think real, reality gap in this case can, can be you mean some sort of visual serving, but the visual serving is done by a uh, network. Is this what you said? Uh, I'm, I'm saying that the dynamics when, when, the control, when you pass through the controller, it's not, I mean, the policy is just approximating some dynamics, but the controller is handling that approximation and doing the best. Okay, well, Probably what, the reality gap. Uh, so it's just the, the policy output's position. And then the controller. Yeah. Or the policy output targets in, in or sort of global. Cost functions. To the cost controller. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yes, you're talking about yesterday's paper, for example, the output of the map, the map directly works, but they don't do any positions, and then this controller, this section, and this design, position. But I mean, I think that's a, an hour design choice, right? And quite often people do have a PD controller which takes a target position and that's the final stage, so the policy is changed by the position. Yeah. So, uh, okay, to sort of, uh, this is a kind of taxonomy that I've created, but uh, I, 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 I really want to stress here that I want your feedback, so if you think that I'm, I'm missing a, a big chunk someplace there, please uh, uh, send me an email or just uh, let's have a chat afterwards. Uh, which leads us to uh, Mathieu, who's uh, going to present uh, Tower and uh, existing uh, approach to uh, motion planning. So he's going to uh, compare a bit uh, both uh, uh, approaches and he's going to give you uh, a nice tutorial on how you can use them. So uh, if you have your laptop with you, uh, I do recommend that you try to follow the, uh, the steps for installing and going through the methods because these are really uh, cool approaches. And uh, thank you very much. Here's Matthew. And in the interest of time, let's just uh, do questions uh, uh, afterwards, if you have any questions. Or if you have a quick question while we set up, go ahead. example of, so you, you had an example of optimization where you might do um, contact planning followed by center of mass trajectory mm -hmm. planning, yeah. or vice versa. Um, I think this week with, um, with Steve's work, for instance, it would be center of mass followed by, followed by contact yeah, planning. Contact, yeah. Is there an example of a system which does go the other way around, which would plan contacts first? Uh, so this this is this is a this is a good question, and uh, this is one uh, research direction that we're following with uh, uh, Martin. So we're looking into different uh, motion planning pipelines or architectures, if you wish. So in some cases, it might make sense to plan footholds first, and then the center of mass trajectories. So in places where you're, you're, you're more constrained with regards to where you can step, for example, this, mm -hmm. this might be the case. 
So if you if you try to go about it by planning center of mass projectors, you might sort of find a nice path, but you cannot really uh, uh, execute with you know good placements that are valid, for example. Uh, so it it really it depends on the morphology of the environment. Uh, of course, this this might be sort of more kind of marginal or corner cases, right? In, in sort of in a general and walking on flat ground and stairs and you know environments that are you know that crazy or they're not mm. search and rescue environment like after earthquakes and so on or disaster scenarios. Uh, yeah, right. But there, there is so may, maybe this is this is a machine learning approach to mm. learn what to do mm. first or. Mm. Mm. Mathieu Gézer, uh, I, I did my PhD in LAS and now I'm working uh, with Dionys in Oxford on the animal robot. Uh, I'm going to present the general, what we can call pattern generator sometimes, or center of mass uh, trajectory optimization. Uh, so it's going to be more general, it can be applied to human robot or quadruped robot. Uh, so for now we have seen uh, different approaches, uh, like uh, Steve present a contact planner and how you can uh, check the feasibility uh, of a trajectory. Uh, Andrew I present how we can uh, generate a controller for the whole body of the robot, but we didn't, uh, we haven't seen yet how to uh, generate the motion of the center of mass so the <coughs> robot can be stable when walking. Uh, so during this presentation, I would like you to use a bit uh, tower. Uh, it's a program that is made in, that was made in ETH. Zurich, uh, and you can install it if you have uh, a ROS, it's pretty easy, you can just follow the instruction on GitHub to install it, so please start to install it if you haven't yet, or if you don't have a uh, ROS, you can maybe download the virtual machine uh, with ROS and Tower.
Alright. Which version of Rust do you need? I I use it with kinetic. Uh, but I don't know if it will work with us. It's going to take a long while to download some things. Yeah. Yeah. More than an hour. Do you have it on a memory stick? Or do you have it on, a, you have it on your computer, the actual image? Uh, no. <laughs> change a bit the parameter, uh, like the frequent parameter. Yeah, it would be better. Is from a library? Yeah, it's from the I love it because I only have three points in the 
10 minutes. No, one minute. Well, well, if you yeah. throw you yeah. with all these dependencies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Can I follow? From sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so maybe I'm gonna continue my presentation while we install the thing. So we already have. We already have seen this uh, equation quite often. It's just the equation of a rigid uh, body system. Uh, and we have seen that we can divide this into two uh, equations. One that corresponds to the free fly of the robot. So the movement of the main body, the root of the robot. And the other equation that corresponds to the actuation. Uh, yeah, each limb of the robot. So, uh, if we only, if we consider that uh, the force we want to apply uh, doesn't, you, you don't uh, get higher than the torque limit of your motor, you can just remove uh, the, the equation uh, that is actuated and just keep the motion of the center of mass. So your model will be just the position velocity uh, of your center of mass and the, the forces you will apply to, to the environment. And this equation actually corresponds just to the Newton and the earlier equation uh, of, uh, uh, of a system. <coughs> and this is an under-actuated system, so we can't really do like test ID uh, where you can just plan, you don't need to predict, you can just apply the torque to get to the, the goal position. Maybe you need to go uh, in the opposite direction to get to your goal position. For instance, with an inverted pendulum, you need first to get a bit backward so the pendulum uh, bend forward and then you can uh, go forward. And for that, uh, we're going to use optimal control. <coughs> so if we look at our current equation, uh, we see that there are some things missing because you can't have always force in your end effector, you have some constraint that you need to actually have contact with the ground to be able to have forces. And with your limi limited, reduced uh, model, you need also to be sure that the contact you want to use will be reachable by the leg. And this is actually uh, the, some problem that gets uh, that make the problem difficult to solve uh, with optimal control. So uh, Nicola already showed the video on the left uh, where you see the robot solving some task uh, using optimal control. But with this formulation, uh, the robot can't really discover a new contact. What the robot can do is just fall on his foot and then realize that he can use it to make force on the ground. And this is because we are using uh, local optimization. So when the robot has the, the leg on the air and you compute the derivative, no matter uh, where the leg is, you won't be able to, uh, to have forces on your leg. So you won't be able to uh, converge to the ground uh, to find the steps. One solution is uh, to add uh, virtual forces. So the, in this thing, first you can have forces in, even if the leg is not on the ground. And this force increase when you get closer to the ground. So the optimization understands that the, the, the foot needs to be close 
to reduce its distance to the ground uh, to have higher force. And then you do several steps of optimization and you reduce these virtual forces till the, you really have contact. So this is one solution, but uh, doing this, you need to compute a lot of steps so, because you need to reduce strongly uh, the virtual forces you can directly uh, compute the final trajectory. Another way is just to specify to the system that you have uh, contact. So you force the system to use its leg at certain time to make contact. So one approach would is to uh, use that each uh, foot or hand it's always a swing phase and a stand phase, no matter how, even if you turn and you do two phases with your left leg, for your right leg, it's always uh, swing and stand and swing. Another way is to uh, take this more globally and say, my first phase will be a double support phase, then a signal support, then again a double support and you separate your, uh, your problem like this. So in this thing, you uh, specify that you want contact at certain time, and it makes the, the problem a lot easier, and you can use optimization uh, to, to solve that. So uh, the, the swing and, uh, and stand phase per leg, is what Tower is doing, and the just double support, single support, or triple support uh, is another pattern generator made by Justin Carpentier. Uh, so here I'm gonna focus mainly on uh, Tower, but I will try to compare them and see how uh, they are different. So. Uh, so the system is modeled as a rigid body. Uh, so in for the uh, so just uh, it simplifies the equation here by saying that you have a constant uh, inertia. <coughs> that you have a constant inertia. Uh, it's, this assumption is, uh, can be valid for quadruped robots because you have a big main body and very lightweight. Uh, <coughs> because you, usually you don't have any motor or you just have a motor on the knee. Uh, this assumption can be very bad for like uh, humanoid robots because you have really big motor in the legs. Uh, so <coughs> the, 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 the variable in uh, your optimization will be the position of the center of mass and the orientation of the body. And then you will also have the position of the legs and the forces that the legs apply to the, to the ground. So this problem is uh, formulated as collocation. So your dynamic is modeled as prime, and you will have certain node to uh, specify the, the, the waypoint of the spline. Um, So by, with the constraint, you can already eliminate some of the nodes, like <coughs> this node and this node. You already know that you want uh, a swing phase, so you won't have any forces during this time. So you can just remove uh, this parameter, and it's just a fixed value in your problem.
Then you also have the reachability of the leg that you need to infer. So here in tower, it's just a box uh, that have a, re a fixed relative position between the main body and this box. And the foot can only stay in this box during the movement. You also have to add uh, the friction gun because you don't want the robot to slip. So to do that, we use a linearized uh, friction gun. So instead of having the, the cone like a ice cream, we just have a pyramid. And then uh, Tower is able to optimize the, the timing of the fate. So you first give a certain timing for uh, as initially guess for your optimization, but then uh, the system is able to change the timing and maybe slow down when you need to do a big jump between a graph or doing a quick uh, step if you want to be more stable. So this is a mathematical formulation. So we have position and orientation of the main body, the timing of uh, the, the walking, uh, the foot position and the force. Uh, and as constraint, we have the initial state, goal state, the dynamic uh, model, <coughs> and then for every foot, we have the non sleeping foot, the foot when uh, in stand phase should be at the height of the terrain. So to that we model the terrain as a height map. Uh, the foot should always push and not pull because it was made for leg uh, quadruped <coughs> robot mainly, so we don't have any hand. And friction gun. Uh, yeah, and no force in the air and total duration. And one thing we can see here is that even if we call that a uh, mathematical optimization problem, we don't have any cost function. The tower only solve uh, the feasibility problem. So it find a trajectory that uh, that is uh, feasible uh, with the constraint and doesn't try to optimize any cost. So this is some result we can see uh, on the video on YouTube. So it's pretty nice. Give you. Uh, Nice trajectory uh, visually. Uh, yeah, and we can see that we can generate different gates here. In the same moment, you just can give a different initial gates for the gate and it will be to able to optimize. Even jumping. How do you initialize, how do you get the initial gate uh, suggestion? Uh, you just have to give the, the initial guess for the optimization. And so the, in the parameter, you have the timing, the different phase. And so you just have to give the correct phase to have the correct gate. OK. So have you downloaded uh, the tower and have you tried to run it? So, so if you run with the road, Ross Lunch, Tower Ross, you should get something like this. Well, you have a nice little interface where you can select the robot, select different terrain, uh, specify the goal position, 
and optimize the trajectory. What's the global global frame on the clock? The global frame. So if you click on global ah, options, yeah. mm -hmm. fixed frame. What would you have? Top left. Global options. Up. Yeah. Open. Okay. You won't see anything till you run and uh, the optimization once. So just try to do ah, okay. uh, to run the optimization. So one thing we can directly see is that you you don't have any collision checking by reducing your model with just your main body and the end effector position. Your uh, your leg can enter in collision with the environment. So is that the limitation of the model? This is one of the limitations. <coughs> uh, when you simplify like this, you will lose some information. And this is one of them. So yeah, you can check after uh, you generate the motion. You can check it. Now you can also uh, try different uh, map for the system. Uh, you have uh, some file, the easiest is just to modify <coughs> one existing uh, uh, example of terrain. Uh, and I would like you to try this kind of environment. The, this is the, the environment uh, Steve uh, show that this can be difficult for uh, the optimization. So maybe, yeah, it's time, so uh, we'll just finish. Uh, so the problem you will get, you won't be able to find a solution there because the, the robot will just try to go straight. And what, one problem with local optimization is that you, you will just linearize your constraint. Uh, so, for the beginning of the trajectory, if you have just one, uh, one initial guess that goes from this point to this point, and you have like two nodes uh, during this trajectory, you will linearize uh, your constraint, uh, term constraint. So you, for the first step, you will have a constraint like this, the second step, the same thing, and then the third step, this thing and you won't be able to see that you actually have a little step that here that you can use to uh, get up. So this is one problem of this kind of approach that 
solving some a student told me oh why should we use uh, Steve Tunnel Planner uh, because Tower is doing this thing and it's real great. The problem is that is that each basically each step can be uh, local minima and you just you can just discover this step if you are lucky enough that uh, one stand phase uh, is exactly at this point. Otherwise, you will always uh, linearize your constraint here or here. So, one way is to uh, use first the contact planner of Steve and then doing your optimization just uh, using or fixing the position of the the, the contact or saying, oh, I know the surfaces and I want to stay in these surfaces, but I can change a uh, slide on those surfaces. So that's what uh, Justin did in his pattern generator. The, the surfaces, the contact surfaces are already uh, uh, given by the contact plan of Steve. So, uh, in last, we, for several times, we try to do the full pipeline uh, of the generation. So, there is the Steve Tunnel Planner to plan the contact sequence, then the, the optimization of the center of mass, and then the, the thing that Andrea or, uh, or Nicola and Carlos presented to generate the full motion. So now, quickly, uh, if what we want to do also is to be really quick because we would like to compute the trajectory of the center of mass on real time. So if you push the robot, you will be able to compute a new uh, trajectory for the center of mass to compensate uh, the push. The problem is that this kind of technique uh, even if you simplify the model, it takes quite a lot of time. So we need more uh, heuristic or technique to reduce the computation time. So one uh, way is to use uh, a, a convex approximation of the angular momentum. So you have the cross product that is quite annoying. And so you, you simplify that by using a convex approximation. I won't talk more deeply, but if you want to see that, uh, you have the paper here. Or you can, uh, instead of having uh, the forces at each contact, you can directly compute the, the range curve. Uh, so just computing the possible um, acceleration and uh, uh, angular momentum that you can have uh, by using a quadratic approximation uh, of your friction curve. And another way is just to use a better initial guess. So if you are already close to the solution, you will just converge in few steps. And this is exactly what this European project is for uh, to learn some kind of uh, good initialization for the, the optimization. What's the password to your virtual machine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the same as the user. Same as the user. Okay, okay. I couldn't find the second paper I was going to ask that.
the this one? Yeah. Uh, if you type uh, Justin Carpentier, you should find his web page on GitHub. Uh, okay, okay. It will be there. If Thank you want, I can send it to you. Thanks.